Welcome to Sex Savvy, where nothing is off limits. I'm Kimberly Resnick Anderson, your host and creator of Sex Savvy. I've been helping couples and individuals achieve optimal sexual health for more than 25 years. I am ready to share my unique insights and sex positive approach with the world. We'll talk about hang ups, kinks, fantasies, and function, what's hot, what's not, and most importantly, how to become sex savvy. Hello, and welcome to this week's episode of Sex Savvy. I'm your host, Kimberly Resnick Anderson. Today we're going to be discussing covert incest, also known as emotional incest, which is a type of abuse that occurs when parents look to their child for emotional support and intimacy that they would normally receive from a spouse or a partner. This type of incest does not involve any direct sexual contact, but rather is quite subtle and nuanced. The concept of covert incest was first introduced in the 1980s by a clinician named Ken Adams. And upon first hearing about this concept, the mental health community pushed back. There was a backlash against this concept. People felt that it was watering down the diagnosis of sex abuse and that it was making virtually any dysfunctional dynamic pathological. But over time, and upon the publication of his hallmark book, Silently Seduced, when parents make their children partners, Ken Adams was able to permeate the mental health community. And this concept now of covert or emotional incept is now widely accepted. When covert incest occurs, a child ends up feeling more like a romantic partner or a surrogate spouse than they do a child. We often use the term that a child will be adultified. Perhaps the parent confides in the child about their loneliness in the marriage or talks about how unfulfilled they are sexually, and this can alienate the child from their other parent Covert incest involves a series of consistent boundary crossings that lead a child to end up feeling burdened by the parent's emotional needs and like they're not able to express their own needs. As I discuss in the interview that I'll be playing for you in just a moment, I think in our society, not that we're comfortable, but we can wrap our head around the notion of a father sexualizing his daughter. Even though it's creepy and it's inappropriate, it doesn't seem so far out of our consciousness that that this could happen. What's spoken about much less frequently is when a mother engages in covert incest with her son. And this, I think, disturbs people on a whole nother level, because we count on mothers to be the nurturing one and the one who sort of intuitively can respect boundaries and understand the role of caring for a child as opposed to fostering a need for the child to care for her. So you'll hear my guest today talk about how his mother made him a surrogate partner for her and how that impacted him sexually, emotionally, and in many other ways. Typically, survivors of covert incest who are male go on to abuse drugs or alcohol, engage in promiscuity. Often they become addicted to porn or engage in some sort of sexually compulsive behavior, whether that be compulsive affairs, compulsive uh, use of strip clubs or prostitutes. And they tend to have uh, difficulty with intimacy. They're able often to be sexually functional in the context of an unmeaningful sexual contact, so like a one-night stand or a hookup. But when they find themselves in a relationship where there's some sort of expectation of reciprocity or some expectation of caring for one another, they often either lose interest or lose their capacity to get and uh, maintain an erection 
or they have difficulty being able to ejaculate. So today, you're very lucky to hear firsthand from um, a beloved podcast host, actually, who is going to be talking about the impact on his life of his covert incest involving his mother. So on a very practical level, I'm going to give you now some examples of things that parents can say that can lead toward this sense of feeling more like a boyfriend or girlfriend than a child. I've had patients say to me that their parents said, um, if I wasn't your dad, I'd marry you. We're so close. I'm closer to you than anyone else. No one else will ever love you the way I do. No one will understand you the way that I do. Don't ever leave me. Please don't cheat on me. They may take the child out on a romantic outing. They may comment on changes in their body as they approach puberty, maybe acknowledging um, pubic hair or underarm hair. And the kids end up feeling creeped out or just yucky about the focus on their body or the sort of romantic, overly intimate nature of the relationship. I had a male patient who told me that when he kissed a girl at age 15, he felt like he was cheating on his mom. Well, I'm very excited to introduce my guest for today. His name is Paul Gilmartin. Many of you will know him as the host of the Mental Illness Happy Hour podcast, where he tackles many of the taboo issues in our culture. And what I love about Paul is that, like me, he's willing to talk about anything. He breaks barriers, he ignores taboos, and he really believes that what's mentionable is manageable. So, Paul, welcome to Sex Savvy. Oh, thank you, Kimberly. You forgot to include that he's desperate for attention. (laughs) Yeah, a little exhibitionistic, maybe. (laughs) (laughs) When I started doing the podcast, I would kind of shame myself with that moniker (laughs) as if it was a shallow thing. Uh And then as I began to deal with the trauma and understand the roots of it, I realized, no, I desperately want to be known and not like famous known, but understood and accepted and which I imagine most people do, but I didn't realize it was as deep and, and as profound as it was and that it came from a place of kind of vulnerable uh, innocence rather than egotistical look at me. Absolutely. And I think you think you're helping people, and you are, but you're really helping yourself. I think your podcast is your medicine. It's therapeutic for you. Yes, it really is. When when people thank me for doing the podcast, you know, and then sometimes they'll say, uh, you know, I get so much out of it. I'll say, and they'll say, oh, you know, thank you. Thank you for doing it. And I say, I, I get as much out of it as, as anybody else. You have been open with your listeners about aspects of your history and struggles that you've had. And for my listeners who don't know you, Paul, and and aren't familiar with your journey, can you give a little synopsis of what you've been through and what your passion is at this point? I'm a survivor of covert incest by my mother, which I couldn't call it that until maybe six, seven years ago. It's something that I feel like I've made a lot of progress in, in healing from. I've been sober 15 years from drugs and alcohol. Good for you. I come from a long line of uh, alcoholics. I used humor for a large part of my life as like my sole coping mechanism. Also, I would say, you know, obviously drinking and drugs and sometimes pornography or sexually acting out, you know, being promiscuous, having kind of meaningless sex. Not that meaningless sex is necessarily a bad thing, but I, th- I think when it's coming from a place of using it to cope with your feelings rather than just doing it for fun. Right. That that to me is a is is a difference. If it's numbing, which is one of the most baffling things until you unnumb yourself. It's so hard to understand why you know, why am, do I keep getting drawn to, you know, maybe it's looking at pornography for 3 hours. You know, why do I do that when I don't want to to do it. And 
I came to find out after being in recovery for a while is because if you are just constantly numbing yourself, getting high on either chemicals in your brain or, you know, uh, chemicals outside of you, it's hard for subtle things to register, uh, you know, looking at a sunset or, you know, having a conversation with a friend. So we keep needing these big jolts to feel alive. Absolutely. I, I've treated probably 100, 200 men who have never had sex sober. Wow. They've never had a sexual contact without being under the influence of some sort of chemicals. And then when they get sober and they have a sexual encounter, it feels so uncomfortable. It's way too intimate. And, mm -hmm. and they're aware of their presence and their humanity and, and their partner's humanity in a way that there is so foreign to them yeah. that they can't get an erection or they can't ejaculate. It's just so uncomfortable because they're they're not numb. They're actually there and they've never learned how to tolerate that kind of intimacy before. And these are guys sometimes in their 30s, 40s, 50s who've never had sex either without being drunk or high. And are the majority of these men, did they experience some type of unwanted sexual experience as a kid or an adolescent? Often. And if not overt sexual abuse or trauma, some sort of trauma. Yeah. Yeah a family dynamic or domestic violence or something going on in the family that made them feel like they needed to escape. Gotcha. Being present and learning to receive sex energetically, give and, and receive, it's really powerful. Really powerful. Really powerful. And, you know, I, I am fairly new to being able to connect emotionally during sex mm -hmm. and to not check out in my head during it. You know, that doesn't mean my brain doesn't occasionally wander, but uh, if it does, I, I will often, you know, share with my partner, you know, where my head is going and invite her into it. And that brings us closer together. But as far as it's grounding, it keeps you yeah. in the moment. It keeps you from going somewhere else. And then as long as you're present and available emotionally, then the shame can't touch you. Yeah. Shame and authenticity, they don't go together. No. No, <laughs> boy, boy, is that an, an understatement. And uh, fairly, at least in the last couple of years, fairly newsworthy to me. I know there's probably a lot of people who will hear this and they probably think that there's something wrong with them if they're the, the type of person that needs to uh, imagine something to have an orgasm, whether... Which, by the way, is most men, yes. by the way. <laughs> That's good to know. And I know women that... Most men do it, Paul, and most men don't like to admit yeah. it. Yeah. Because you feel like something is the matter with you. And that's why inviting your right. partner to it. You know, when I'm with my girlfriend, sometimes I'll have trouble getting to the, to the, to the climax. And even though I'm enjoying myself, you know, maybe my arms are getting tired or something. <laughs> and, and that's a great time to, you know, say, Hey, you know, I'm imagining such and such scenario and describe it in detail to her. And it, and it really brings us closer together and right. allowing her to love that part of me and then feeling her love that part of me, not just tolerate it, That's right. but love Celebrate that part it. of me. Oh mm -hmm. my God, mm -hmm. that opened up a part of, of my, I don't know, psyche, heart, soul, spirit, that I had never experienced before. And well, because you were open to it. If someone yeah. tried to love you or embrace you, then they lost credibility with you because you're inherently unlovable or so you thought. So for them to want to be with you and share in your fantasies and all of the, you would have wondered what the hell was wrong with them. Right. Yes. Yeah. And accepting their humanity, as you mentioned earlier in the podcast, the, the feeling until I started setting boundaries with people, cutting toxic people out of my life, there was a feeling that when I went out my door in the morning, I was at the mercy of the world around me. Just like you were at the mercy of your mother. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, and that was such an old feeling, such a primal, profound, pervasive feeling in you that you never developed, I think, based on what I've heard you share, the autonomy that is necessary to move from stage to stage of development, like you developmentally got stuck. Yeah, absolutely. I remember being in my 20s and I don't know, I was at a grocery store or something and this mother said to her her child, uh, honey, uh, let the man go in front of us. And I just wow. remember thinking, I don't feel like a man. Wow. Because you were still colluding unwittingly in that dynamic. You didn't understand. Mm-hmm. No, I thought I was being a good son. Exactly. Exactly. And what ways do you think the way that your mother covertly sexualized or eroticized you, how do you think that impacted your erotic template, Paul? Uh, I think it made control an important aspect. It made me always want to be the one who was uh, pursuing because there was just something that really grossed me out about a woman drinking me in with her eyes because that's what my mother did. And so it would remind me of that. So a woman who would be present and loving and attentive would often just really kind of gross me out. So I needed a certain amount of emotional distance to feel comfortable. But, you know, as far as the template, it was mostly about visual things and not about emotional things. So, you know, I think that's why I was drawn to pornography is... Um, you know, when I first started masturbating as a teenager, and I know this isn't unique by any means to me, I know men are very visual, but I wasn't able to really get off to anything beyond that. I couldn't, uh, you know what, maybe a one night stand would be exciting because of the newness of it. Right, right. But after the orgasm, it would be like, I wanted nothing to do with that person because I had already taken what I wanted, which sounds horrible. And it wasn't like a conscious decision. It's just how I felt. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. And I felt shame about it. I felt broken. You know, I know I hurt women out there and I, and I still have trouble forgiving myself because I just don't like the idea that, that I was a pig and I objectified women and And then I'm sure I probably negatively impacted some lives uh, out there. Were you turning the tables? Were you empowering yourself so that you would never be at the mercy of a woman again? Yeah, I think to to charm a a woman into bed was the ultimate high for me. You know, even even beyond the sex itself would be feeling a woman fall for me or you know, become willing. Uh, yeah. Uh, that yeah. was, that was the foreplay. Yeah. And you know, this term would, is it fair to say that you were grooming the women? Yeah. I don't, I don't think that's, you know, my first instinct is to go, Oh my God, that sounds so predatory. But there was a <laughs> bit of a, a, a predatory nature. In retrospect, I think you can say that. Yes. I don't think you felt that at the time. Oh, I, God, I, no. I, I think you thought you were a a reasonably decent guy. I don't think you realized the dynamic that you were creating and how damaging it was for you Mm -hmm. and for those women. No, I didn't. Um, You know, I suppose the template for me um, as as a kid was that if you want something, you just persistently go about it because that's kind of what my mom would do. And so I would... You take yeah, it. I would, you just take I it. I would pester yeah. women. And I thought, well, just because I'm not physically restraining them or they're not crying or, you know, screaming stop, that it's not abuse. But I look back and it, 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 was, it was absolutely abuse because I wasn't listening to them. You know, I wasn't really. You weren't interested. I wasn't interested in what they wanted. I wasn't putting myself in their shoes. I was entitled. And who did that to you? That This was all uh, what we call identification with the aggressor. You became the one who took what you wanted. You became the one who wasn't interested in someone else's experience or, or affective state. Yeah. 
yeah, that's it's it's so true and it's so hard to reckon with. And I don't want to blame it on my mom while it certainly influenced my actions and there was a certain amount of unconsciousness on my part. You know, I was also an adult and I think I should have gotten help sooner than I did. Better late than never. And now you're paying it forward. Each week, 50,000 people are inspired by you and what you offer them. So better late than never. And you're certainly making up for it in spades at this stage of your life now. Well, that, that means a lot to me. And that's super hard to take in. No, it's actually not that hard to take in. It, it's, <laughs> there's a part of me that will always feel a little bit like a fraud, you know, because uh, because of my past. And I have to remember that I'm a human being who makes mistakes like like other people. And it's uh, take my own advice, which I give to other people, which is, you know, that's right. That is that's redemption. I wonder if you could speak to this theme of a hidden agenda, because I think in a lot of the men that I've treated who experienced the kind of sexualization as children that you did, they develop a kind of covert operation of their own to kind of compulsively reenact the dynamic, but this time they're in charge. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is there anything you could say to speak to this hidden agenda theme? Yeah, it dawned on me maybe a decade or so ago that the real turn on for me isn't the sex necessarily. It's the the mind games that win a woman over, you know, especially if it's a woman who initially seems disinterested. In fact, for a long time, the hottest sex for me would be with a woman who was just mildly interested. Sex with a woman who was super turned on by me really made me want to shut down. And I always wondered, what the fuck is the matter with me? But, you know, after enough therapy and trauma work, etc., cetera, I, I was able to realize that, oh, my mom had a hidden agenda. She used her access to my body as a child to do things that were unnecessary, you know, taking my temperature rectally until I was eight years old and asked her, why are we still doing it this way? And, you know, her not really giving me a, an answer that was believable, you know, I, I'm afraid you're going to bite down on the thermometer. Well, then why are you not doing it with my brother? Who's almost my same age? I, you know, I, this was it plausible. Yeah. Yeah. There was lots of Didn't things. Ring where true. I, yeah. Where I just, it didn't sit right with me. Can you speak to that, Paul, that intuitive ickiness, that sense of this doesn't feel right, but I can't articulate it. I don't have the uh, maturity or the vocabulary to question, but I know in my gut that this is a boundary crossing. Can you speak to that feeling? Yeah, it's a feeling of kind of numbness. It's interesting because I could feel outrage if somebody was was doing that to a child you know i would feel outrage i would want to protect that child yet it's so difficult for me to get in touch with the outrage about what was done to me as a child because i think i i just put those things away in an attic and and shut the door and I don't know. There's just this kind of cloak of numbness around it every once in a while, especially if I look at a picture of myself from the age that the abuse was happening. I'll feel some of the sadness yep. or some of the anger at my mom. And that's very common. You and I discussed the uh, Leaving Neverland documentaries that's, yeah. that are airing now on, on HBO. And the two men that came forward, both independently said that they had no empathy for themselves as little boys. It was only when they had sons and they became fathers were they able to connect to the innocence and the naivete. Yeah, They didn't have that care for themselves. Yeah. It was so interesting. No, I, I just think that because of the self-loathing, because of the shame, because of the... Uh, 
I must have, there must have been a reason I must have given off some sort of, I must have had something to do with this or, or I liked this. Right. I'm making too big of a deal. I'm doing it for attention or, you know, one time I got uh, an erection, you know, she wasn't touching my genitals, but she was giving me a bath and I was like 12 because I had gravel in my knee. And at the time, you know, that feeling that you were talking about, it was just so just below my consciousness. It was just, I could just feel myself Mm -hmm. pressing that truth down below my consciousness and knowing that this did not feel right. And the shame, imagine, I mean, I'm preaching to the choir here, but imagine having an erection, 12 year old boy in the tub, your mother's there, the, the humiliation, the confusion, the shame, the titillation all at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, it really fucked me it up. All got, it all got paired together. Yeah. All these competing feelings left you with a very confusing understanding of your own sexual map. Yeah, and I think it also gave me a warped sense of the importance of my penis to, yes, to a woman or, yes. or a female. Because in my mind, I suppose, I subconsciously thought, well, there must be something really powerful if my mom is tricking me into being naked all the time. <laughs> right. That's right. That that's the point. That's your identity. That's the value that you offer. Right. It's in your genitals. Right. That's what made you lovable and masculine. Yeah. And so when someone loved you or tried to love you in a non-sexual way, it made you so angry. Yes. Oh my God. I remember (laughs) feeling rage at a girl I was dating uh, my senior year of high school. We were at a party and she just smiled this beautiful, vulnerable smile at me. Like she was just (laughs) happy in the moment. And I felt this rage come up and I said, what the fuck are you smiling about? Smiling at? Yes. I can top that. I I, I treated a man who was at a bar, noticed an attractive woman that he might have wanted to get her phone number or ask out. And then he thought, even if she says yes, and we go out on a date and we become a couple, she's going to cheat on me. It's only a matter of time because all women betray. So fuck her, went up to her, mind you, having never spoken to her, poured a drink on her and said, fuck you. Wow. And she was like, excuse me, do I know you? Like, what the hell? And he was like, fuck you. (laughs) So in his mind, he went from, I don't even know her to, I'm going to ask her out to, we're going to be a couple. She's going to cheat on me. And she deserves getting a drink thrown in her face all within like one minute. Wow. Talk about projection, right? Yeah. You know, it's funny because the, the one thing that I have never been is jealous. I I have never felt possessive over a woman I'm dating. And I don't know why that is. You know, if my current girlfriend were to, you know, cheat on me with somebody, I would certainly be devastated. But it's not something I spend any time thinking about. And and I wonder, obviously, that's probably healthy. But given the things that I've experienced in my life, there's maybe a, a pathological underpinning. I I could throw out an interpretation if you're interested, just for kicks and giggles. Yeah. In order to be jealous, you have to value something. Mm. And if you value something, then you're vulnerable. Right. And so to be jealous would be to acknowledge a vulnerability Mm -hmm. that I value you and I would be, you know, it would be a loss if you were not in my life. But you couldn't even get to that place of acknowledging an emotional connection deep enough for it to be valuable. And so why would there be a threat? Right. Does that ring true at all? It does for the past. But right. In the, for in the, the past. Present. And I suppose in because- the present, it's because you've done your work, sir, and you are- right you're healthy. That's why you're not jealous now. I think in the past, it was due to a lack of 
capacity or emotional intelligence to value something because if you don't value it, then you wouldn't care if it was no longer available to you, right? Yeah. I was too busy being suicidal. My mm-hmm. plate was full. Oh. <laughs> for how long were you suicidal? For years? On and off or yeah. consistently? Yeah. I think until I got sober uh, mm-hmm. 15 years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, that was the game changer for me. And, you know, a lot of times people will fill out a survey mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that I read on the podcast and they'll have a bunch of issues going on. And one of the ones they will name, you know, is maybe drinking or getting high and they're, they're doing it compulsively. And one of the things I always say is it is nearly impossible to get a grasp on any of the other issues to heal from trauma or any other stuff. If you are constantly self-medicating. Absolutely. So for people out there listening who are stuck in shame, Paul, you've done it. You've done the work. I think 15 years ago, you couldn't imagine feeling as healthy and peaceful as you do today, correct? No, no, not at all. It didn't feel like that would be available to you ever. No, I didn't realize I felt cornered in my life. I thought I was just somebody that was born without the capacity to be happy and appreciate Mm. things. Mm. And so it's so great to know that I'm, I'm not broken. Um, yeah, I'm wounded and there's scar tissue, but I'm functioning. You're more than functioning. You're thriving. You are resilient. Keep going. You're you're more than functioning. I'm going to write this shit down. (laughs) And really cute too. (laughs) And funny. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) Yeah, you're you're more than surviving, Paul. I do feel like that. You're touching people. You're helping people. You're inspiring people. And that's why I wanted wow. to invite you on my show because I love Thank that energy. You. Thank you. But for the men and women out there who, I know each week you try to uplift, but for my listeners who are new to you and your special powers, what would you say to help them process that shame? What, any suggestions? It will not heal in the dark. It seems counterintuitive that to get rid of shame, you need to talk about the things that you feel shameful about. It's who you share it with that matters. You know, don't bring it up in the middle of a group of people at a sports bar one night. (laughs) Find people who you notice are safe and discreet and capable of having emotional conversations or go see a therapist or join a support group. All of those things have been necessary for me to let go of the shame. The biggest places for me to let go of the shame have been the support groups where people have had similar experiences. And it's allowed me to see that I am not unique in what I feel or what I struggle with, the circumstances of my life might be slightly different than the person sitting next to me. But the way we feel about ourselves and the shitty coping mechanisms we've been using our whole life are pretty similar. Yep. We all tend to think that we suffer in silence, Mm -hmm. that we're the only one experiencing what we're experiencing. But pain is pretty universal. And I think what you said about community is so key. Yeah. And I would agree the best thing to do to resolve shame is to get a big old 1,000 watt spotlight and shine it right on that thing. Yep. Yep. And don't. That's it. That's that's. And don't give up. If the first person you open up to, you know, isn't receptive or seems uncomfortable, that's not a reflection of the shame that you're sharing with them. It's just that that person's either not ready or incapable of handling. A lot of people are incapable of having deep conversations, but that doesn't mean that there aren't people out there who will. So it involves getting out of your comfort zone. And, you know, the things that you are not willing to do to get better may be the very thing that can unlock you getting better. So having an open mind. The only thing, the only thing. It's hard to know the weight that we're carrying around until we start to unpack it. That's right. That's right. And I never realized how much weight I was carrying around until I wasn't carrying it around. That's right. I never realized how numb I was until I wasn't numb. 
because it was my normal. It's like, you know, water to a that's fish. That's right. If that's all you know, then you don't know any different. So one last question I want to ask you for parents out there who may be unwittingly adultifying their children, who have good intentions, who don't fully appreciate the nuances of of the boundaries, what would you say to them to help them be curious and self-reflective about how they may be setting up dynamics that are not helpful to their children? Well, there's a book I know that you're a fan of. It really changed my life uh, called Silently Seduced by Ken Adams. And he's kind Great of book. The, yeah. The classic. He's the, the pioneer in coining the term covert incest. And his book, yeah. Silently Seduced, told my story. And wow. it helped me realize that what I experienced and the way that I reacted to it and the shitty coping mechanisms I developed to soothe myself are a part of a pattern that happens when kids are sexualized or parentified by by a, a parent and so i was a syndrome yeah with predictable comp- yeah yeah so i would say to to i think every parent should read silently seduced because it's it's just so helpful and it's so not talked about it's so not talked about and especially mothers towards their yes. sons you know, our, our society has a fair amount of awareness of fathers being inappropriate with daughters because we do think of men as being sexual and we do think of daughters of being innocent, yes, and sexualized. But we don't tend to think of mothers as being sexual and boys as being innocent. You know, we think, oh, they can handle anything. They're little soldiers, but Getting creeped out is getting creeped out. It doesn't matter what's between your legs, you know. so true. You need to feel safe in your home. And the other thing I would say to parents is, you know, when you're giving a kid a hug or you're giving a kid a kiss or you're snuggling with a kid, ask yourself, am I doing it for them or am I doing it for me? Thank you for saying that. Look at their body language, you know. Right. What's the agenda? Do you need to cuddle or do they need to cuddle, right? Right. And, and if you're in a primary relationship, adult relationship where your emotional needs are not being met, it's so easy to turn to a child to meet those needs. Yeah. Yeah. I treated a man who told me his mother would dress him up in a sailor suit every Sunday and they would go out for an early dinner. He was eight. And he would order for her. Oh, my God. He would order as if he were the husband. The lady will have the shrimp cocktail and uh, the salmon. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I treated another man whose mother said to him, why do you need a girlfriend when you have me? Man, that, that will fuck a kid up. So. Oh, my God. Fucked him up. Yeah. You wouldn't believe. You would not believe. My mom would say things to me like, you know, hey, sailor, can I buy you a drink? (sighs) Hello, Mr. Gilmartin. This is Mrs. Gilmartin. (sighs) And I would just shut down because one of the ways that my mom groomed me was she would fall apart, you know, when my dad wasn't around and kind of Mm -hmm. manipulating me Mm -hmm. into consoling her. And so her being the one that needed to be cared for emotionally and I just immediately would say, what does she need rather than, are my feelings valid? Am I being creeped out? Should, you know, should I ask, should I say, I don't like this? And the few times that I would say something, she would just kind of act like I was being overly dramatic. So do you feel like you were sexually abused or emotionally abused? You know, I do feel like I was sexually abused and it's taken me a long time. I, well, both actually, because there was a lot of criticism as well. And while I know, you know, part of, of being a, a, a parent is, you know, sometimes telling kids things that they don't want to hear that, that may be critical, you know, calling a kid a, a selfish bastard, you know, and that you want to leave the family when the kid's seven, that's emotionally abusive. You know, the thing with a thermometer, if you're inserting something into a child's rectum that isn't necessary, that's a form of rape. Absolutely. And I could not call it that until I had a dream, uh, actually, about a year ago. 
And in the dream, a group of people were inserting something into Mm. me. And in the dream, I woke up and they were all kind of scattering and, you know, kind of giggling. And I was like, what the, what the fuck is going on here? And, and, and I saw that this thing that they'd been inserting into me. And I was like, this is fucking rape. You fucking raped me. Your psyche couldn't manifest that dream until you were ready to process it. Yeah. I couldn't even call it incest for the longest time. And I still, honestly, there's a voice in my brain when I talk about it that rolls its eyes and goes, here we go again, Mr. Victim, Mr. Attention Seeker. You don't have it as bad as anybody else. Why are you trying to belong to this club? You're, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Sure, but I, sure. The healed part of my brain says, no, what she did to me was unlawful. <laughs> unlawful. Correct. Correct. And sick. And sick. And sick. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you are an inspiration. I would like to invite all my listeners to check out your podcast, Mental Illness Happy Hour. Tell them when it airs and how they can find it. New episodes go up every Friday morning. Uh, You can go to the website, mentalpod.com, or you can find it through whatever podcast player that you like. Wonderful. Paul Gilmartin, it's an honor. Keep up what you're doing, and I hope we can uh, connect again in the future. Thank you. I love uh, talking about this stuff and keep doing what you're doing because uh, so many of these things need to be talked about and destigmatized. And a lot of people need comfort and clarity out there. That's right. And that's my mission is to speak of the unspeakable, break through those taboos and barriers. And I think we accomplished that today. So best of luck to you, my friend. And thank you so much for being on Sex Savvy. My pleasure. You've been listening to Sex Savvy. If you find value in this podcast, please like, follow, share, comment, or review on your favorite podcast app. Your participation helps keep Sex Savvy free and available to all who are interested. Kimberly and the entire Sex Savvy team appreciate your loyalty and support. 